Welcome to the State of Affairs in partnership with Serbian Radio Chicago. We're having conversations that matter and continuing the series on defending the border. I have an honor to be joined by Sabine Durden today, continuing our conversation with Tom Holman, former director of ICE, who is a mutual friend. Sabine, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Olga, for having me. I'm so honored. Great to see you again, and I'd like to introduce you to our viewers as an angel mom, because that is what you are, but please tell our listeners who and, and viewers who don't know, what is an angel mom? Sure, an angel mom was deemed by Donald Trump uh, when he heard about American mothers who lost children because of illegal aliens. And he started that after I met him personally in 2015. Um, I became an angel mom on July 12, 2012, when my only child, the love of my life, my best friend, my 30-year-old son, Dominic, um, was on his way to work in California. He worked at the Riverside Sheriff's Department as a 911 dispatcher. And he was riding his motorcycle to work when an illegal alien with two felonies, armed robbery, grand theft auto, two DUIs, um, one deportation, he always got a break. He took his, he drove his truck unregistered, unlicensed, uninsured, and turned it in front of Dominic at 5.45 a.m. Um, July 12, 10 years ago, and killed him instantly. He tried to escape, but some people watched it in horror and caught up with him. The judge knew him, the DA knew him. They covered for him, and long story short, they only gave us a hearing where he pled guilty to a misdemeanor vehicular manslaughter without gross negligence. He had no license, he's done this before. He was, he was drunk and barely under the legal limit. And he received a sentence of nine months in five year probation and he served only 35 days. Wow. So Sabine, I've, you and I have been friends for, for quite some time. Tom yeah. Holman is a friend of ours. Uh, we trust him. He did a great job. But at some point, you told me that President Donald Trump saved your life. What was that about? Oh, um, after, well, Dominic was my only child. And after his dad and I divorced, we shared a household. We were best of friends. We just, we were pretty much inseparable. We were each other's best friends and uh, life was really good. He was looking forward to becoming a helicopter pilot. He had a pilot's license in a small plane. So my life was with him, around him. And when he was killed, people don't know what to do. They don't know what to say. And then once the media, well, once I found out that the, that the killer of my son was an illegal alien, I started getting louder because now I started waking up. This was 100% preventable. He didn't have to be in this country, period. He had no right to. So the more I talked about illegal aliens, people disappeared and I became very, very depressed. And my poor fiance, now my husband, had no idea that I planned to kill myself. I was ready to go. I wanted to be with my son. I just didn't know how to deal with this anymore. And I, had the plans, I was gonna drive my, my car over a cliff, take off the seatbelt and be done with it. Well, when Donald Trump came down the escalator in New York and everybody remembers that. Yes. I was walking through my living room and I glanced over and at that time I wasn't politically involved. I, I wasn't um, outspoken like that, but I walked past the TV and I saw him come down the escalator and I wondered, oh, what is he going to do? And when he stepped up to the mic, I thought he's going to do another apprentice show or something. And when he mentioned he's running for president and then he said a few other things and then he mentioned illegal immigration. Mm -hmm. Olga, I looked up to God and I dropped to my knees and I just lost it because I felt this was the sign that I needed, you just stay, hang in there. There's more to come. How much more to come? I had no clue. And if you would have told me 10 years ago, all the things I've been doing, people I've met, 
going to the White House, speaking at the RNC in Cleveland, I would have asked you to please put the bottle down. <laughs> but see that Pat even brought all of us together. Yes. Um, it's an in, unimaginable pain. I'm a parent. Um, yeah. I, I cannot even wrap my mind around um, going through what you've been through, losing your child, but you are such a strong fighter and an incredible woman that has been through a lot, but you have used your pain in such a positive way to, to impact others and, and to tell your story. And I know that President Trump and, and his policies were crucial in this because nobody really talked about this. But why is it that we keep hearing that protecting our border and defending a border, which every country in this world does, yeah. why is it only racist in America to protect and secure our borders? Um, I learned through the 10 years of traveling and talking and speaking, becoming friends with you and Tom, um, the easiest thing for people to shut you down is call you a racist. As you can see, my son in the background, he called himself German chocolate. He was born in Germany. His father was black. Um, people call me a racist. My husband is black. What they do is with that statement is they want you to shut up and defend yourself while getting away from the subject. Yes. Um, I usually ask a lot of questions when people come at me about these poor immigrants. I say, no, 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 no. First of all, they are illegal aliens. They are not undocumented immigrants. We are immigrants because we came the legal way. Yes. We provided a lot of payments, a lot of paperwork, a lot of medical checks. They want to shut us up. So the best thing is to call everybody racist who is against people that we know nothing about that have five identities that are not who they claim they are. And yes, there are some good ones in between, but it makes no difference. They still enter illegally. Um, it's a awful, horrific game that this government is playing. They're playing Russian roulette because since I lost my son, I met, I can't even count them. I met so many angel moms and dads. That's what I do besides traveling. I talk with them, I call them, they contact me. And a lot of them don't wanna talk uh, publicly about it. They're afraid of people calling them racist. That is so sad. Now, Sabine, have you been to the border in fact? Yes, I've been numerous times. Uh, I've, got, I've gone and I've gotten behind the scene tours and every time I'm there, it is, it's so hard. Last, the last time I was there, I broke down because I stood at the Rio Grande and I saw footprints across the river in the sand where I know they come across. Yes. And I imagined at that moment that maybe my son's killer came across right here. And we have Americans that uh, still think it won't affect them and it does. Yearly, it costs us $53 billion just for anything that has to do with illegals. When they come across and they get fed and housed and clothed and traveling all over the state, we're paying for this because these nonprofit organizations get money back from our government. So we're paying for our own destruction. And yes. I don't want to see another angel mom. I don't want to hug another angel mom or dad. Because accidents do happen, but this was preventable. And if only people would follow the law and quit making excuses like happening now in DC and in, in New York. Oh, 500,000 illegal aliens in New York were okay because you needed them to vote. But now yeah. that 500 or 1,000 more are there, now you need money. Come on, it, it's, it's a political game. And I'm not just worried about Americans getting killed. Children getting raped, babies are getting raped, women getting raped on the way over. And That's that is something I, I talked to yeah. Tom about. And I yeah. a lot of people who haven't been on the board, see, we, we worked some of these issues. You know my background on, on yes. transnational crimes and, and human trafficking. You've seen it yourself. 
a lot of people in our circles have been to the border, have seen how terrible and, and devastating this is. And I talked to Tom about this, and I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, tell our listeners again, what are rape trees? Oh, goodness. Uh, the first time I saw it, it, it leaves you almost paralyzed. Yes. A rape tree is a tree where you find little girls' underwear, bigger underwear, and it's a sign to the next gang that brings their human um, cargo across that they put up their little trophies, the underwear of women and children they rape. They hang their underwear in the tree. That's a blatant sign of what they do. There's yes. so much more going on. And when I always hear people talk about, oh, the poor children, 40% of those children disappear because nobody's doing background checks. They get picked up by pedophiles. They end up in snuff films. If you don't know what that is, you might not want to Google it because you can't forget that. Very true. It's, it's horrific what's happening to human beings. I don't care where they come from. Yes. But and that is the to... point. Yes. That is the point here. Yeah. We are actually fighting to protect even these humans that will risk everything yes. to come to this country. Yeah. And and even the stories that Tom has told us, I mean, the that dead bodies and and as you said, raped women and children. I've seen diapers on those trees. It is truly truly yeah. horrific and it changes you forever. It, it really does. And I'm so glad I've been friends with Tom Holman for about eight years. He's been an amazing friend, true friend. And I'm so blessed that I get to work on a project called the Tom Holman Project. Mm -hmm. Defend the border safe lives.org. You can find out uh, us there. Um, just like you, we will not stop talking about it. And people still, I think it's a protection in their head that they can't believe how bad it is, but you don't want this to happen to your loved one. So you to have anyone, to, you have to wake up because it's happening. We here live in a little town in Arkansas and we had a father arrested that raped his daughter for years. And then while he was in that little jail, his son visited and somebody overheard the conversation found out the brother was raping his sister as well. Oh, they were illegal yeah. aliens. They sliding under the law. We, they are we and have to obey. They they do whatever and they get protected. Yes. And see, that's the thing from what we see on the ground, what our border agents deal with every oh. day. Once it trickles up into the political arena, this is not talked about. This is that, not discussed in the mainstream media and it is painted black or white. You are either racist and you have to talk about it under a certain prism or yep. we only have to talk about the good ones that come over. Well, sure. But what about all of these horrific things that are happening on our south, southern right. border, but all around the world, in fact? Yeah, yeah. people Sabine, are you are. People are in denial, but I believe that people like yourself are going to slowly wake them up. Uh, you are an incredible fighter. I am, again, so sorry that you had to go through this, but you're somebody who's helping others. And this is Thank why you. you are still here. And I'm glad you are here. Thank you, Olga. So are you. I'm so honored to be in your presence because you've been doing this a lot longer than I have. Thank you. And we're going to continue fighting together. We you are looking it. at this red wave in November. You and I, just before we um, started talking uh, officially, you know that Serbian Americans have been a part of, of this sort of red wave since 2016, yes. bringing back President Trump in 2020. But now there's this big conversation that, that you know about um, Superstar tennis player, Serbian, right. Novak Djokovic cannot enter the United States. He's probably one of the healthiest humans alive. Yet people that you and I are talking about flock to these yep. borders and cross over daily, completely unvetted, medically or yep. otherwise. 
Yeah. It's, so it's that is the insane. hypocrisy that we deal with. Yes, it's insane. Just he like I told my sister who mm-hmm. cannot come to America unless she gets vaccinated and she's not going to get that. So I told her, I said, just fly into Mexico, come across, get you some free cash, free flight, and you're good to go. Oh. You won't need nothing. That's pretty much it. We can yeah. walk walk Novak Djokovic over the Rio That's Grande right. and here we are. <laughs> and he'll, he'll have extra spending money thanks to FEMA and the government. True that. <laughs> Sabine, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm going to see you soon. And you are indeed a fighter and an angel mom. Thank you, Olga. Thank, thank you. you. God, thank you. God bless you too. Hi, Tom. Dr. Avasi, how are you? I'm good. So we're going to record just audio and uh, we'll air it this way. I'll send you all the links if you don't mind. Okay. How much time do we have? Are you strained for time? Yeah. Okay. All right. Just give me a sec and I will plug us in. Yeah, I can give you 15 minutes. All right. Good. Works for me. Welcome to the State of Affairs in Partnership with Serbian Radio Chicago. We are having conversations that matter. And today I'm honored to be joined by Tom Homan, our former Executive Director of Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So... I know you're coming to us from CPAC in Texas. Tell me, what is the energy like? Because we're plowing through into November, and it seems like there is a new sheriff in town in terms of this red wave. I think people are energized. People are sick and tired of what the Biden administration is doing in this country, not just on the border, but to our economy, to gas prices, to you know, to, to the military. I think people are fired up. I think you're going to see a... A big, big red wave from uh, November. Very good. And uh, we just are coming off from this big win in Arizona, but it seems like Maricopa County was having issues again. And we're going to talk about the border and all the things that are bread and butter for you. But let's just go back to that moment in 2020. And we still obviously haven't resolved some of these issues what are your thoughts going into November and obviously then looking into 2024? Can we really move forward? Because there are still unanswered questions about what happened in 2020. Look, I think, I think there's some problems. And we're the greatest country on earth. We can't count votes in the first 24 hours. That's a problem. So I see Maricopa County as an issue like it was an issue during 2020. It's seemed like they haven't improved. My hope is that Carrie uh, Lake becomes the governor and uh, she takes control of that state and looks into what the voting problems are. You know, it, I don't know if there's nothing in the world that can't decide an election within a day. And here we are almost three days with Arizona. And we look, we look way back with Trump when, when, when one Trump took in uh, Al Gore. I mean, you know, it's just, we got it. This country needs to be better. The greatest country on earth. I mean, look at these voting irrelevant irre- irregulars and fix it. It, it, it. There's no reason it can't be fixed. People, we have to, we have to have a task force designed to do nothing. But look at you know local elections, state elections, federal elections, and, and find out what is the problem and let's fix it once and for all. And just, we can't have every election questionable. We can't. I do have faith that my vote counts. And every American needs to have that same faith. So we got to move forward. Maricopa County seems, seems to be entirely screwed up. I got paid to carry Lake from the governor there. Yep. And I know for a fact that she's a governor. She would make sure I address. Excellent. And we were backing her. We were backing Abe and uh, Blake Masters now. So it certainly is a new day, but we still have some work to do. Now, let's go back to your time in office. I mean, obviously, you have seen some incredible stuff. We're looking at the disaster on our border. And obviously, the Biden administration is not doing anything about it. Quite to, to the contrary, they're galvanizing this. What difference do you see 
from your time in office and from President Trump's time in office to today, where we have over 200,000 encounters now with illegal immigrants, what difference do you see in particular? We got way over 200,000 encounters since Joe Biden became president. We like seven million last year, and this year we're going to have over two million encounters. Wow. Uh, and we're going to have over one million Galloway. So we're going to look at a total of five million people across that border since Joe Biden became president two years. That is going, we want the most secure border in my lifetime under President Trump or illegal migration without a 40 year law. We, we want the most secure border with a 40 year law to unprecedented illegal immigration crisis. So we want from zero to 100. And uh, again, not by confidence, not by mismanagement, but by design. This is their plan. This is open borders, what they ran on, and keep us promise. And uh, Joe Biden saw all the progressive left who, you know, their ideology is that open borders are a good thing. They're hoping these people are future Democratic voters and they can take control of Congress forever. But I think you're wrong. I think and I think we'll take back the House and hopefully the Senate in November. And I and I and we're gonna take back the White House in twenty four. And we'll have we got a lot of fixing to do. Uh, but unfortunately we already have the plan, the plan that worked, that they gave us the most career border ever. And I plan on going back and if the right guy goes back in twenty four. We're simply going to dust off the playbook we use under Trump and, and re control, re establish control of the border. So, our mutual friends, um, General Flynn and, and Laura Logan, are going to join you um, starting in Texas from, from what they told me, and you guys are going to do a border series. What concrete steps do you think we all can take? Because I think our listeners don't even understand what an average day uh, you guys, on, on, on an average day, what you see on that border. And I've heard you speak before, and, and you told us some harrowing stories about encounters and deaths and, and human trafficking and child trafficking what concrete steps can we all take to actually change this, as you said, once and for all? Well, again, I think, we, I think once we take back the White House, we, we turn the Trump policy back on. Until then, and we can take back Congress in November, but still the, the President Biden will have the power to use up to pen. So the people are listening need to hold your current congressmen and senators responsible. Now, you know, I talk to Republican conscience that would say that we don't control Congress, we can't do anything. That's a bunch of crap. The Republican congressmen and senators can hold Congress hostage. What I mean by that is they don't negotiate with Congress any infrastructure bill, any budget bill. They don't they, they, they tell the Democratic people the Democrats control the House, we're not gonna negotiate anything. We're not even gonna sit at the table with you until you show us one move, one thing that you're gonna to do to slow the flow on the border. So, you know, that's the first thing. We got we got to stop working with the Democrats. If they refuse to secure the border, then walk off, you know, get off the table, get away from them. Uh, but I got faith we're going to take Congress back in November and we can start, you know, at least, I think first thing we do is impeach uh, DHS Secretary Mayorkas, get the hell out of there, because he finally made his oath. He, he, he hasn't done a single thing to secure the border. And I think we move forward with that. But, you know, people need to understand that your listeners, regardless of what your thoughts are on, Illegal immigration. When you got this many people coming across the border, that's caused up to seventy percent of border agents to, to get off the line. What happens is that's when the drugs come through that have killed over a hundred thousand Americans. Yeah. That's when the gang members and the criminals come through, and that's when uh, you know uh, a known suspected terrorist come across the border. Terrorists ain't going to put in for a visa like the, the, the 9 11 terrorists. They're not going to apply for a visa and they're not going to apply to get a plane ticket when they know they have to be vetted through numerous databases. Rather than, you know, be, being found out by vetting on the government, they'll simply cross the border the way 900,000 900, others did. They'll all cross the southwest border. They're not going to be vetted at all. So, regardless of what your stance on illegal immigration is, it's much bigger than that. It's a, it's a public safety issue, it's a public health issue, it is a national security issue. Absolutely. And, and I want to talk about two aspects of this. As a national security issue, a lot of this connects to our foreign policy. And, and you and I both know that what we're looking at today, compared to what President Trump did, having had not just the border out, uh, under control, but entire foreign policy under the control 
of the America first ideology, what we see now and the breakdown around the world is also affecting our borders. So can you connect those dots for our listeners so that they understand that everything that happens around the world actually has that effect on the border as well? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, President Trump is a powerful man, and the world respected him. And they have been pushing him around. And I think President Biden has shown his weakness from day one. The, the withdrawals in Afghanistan was an embarrassment. And that's why you see Russia coming in on Ukraine, and that's why you see China make moves they're making. They didn't dare do that under President Trump, because President Trump was a, a, a strong leader. But people need to understand when they strike around the world, and countries are in really bad shape, they all look to the United States as a place to plead to. Yep. And you can't be a welfare country for the whole world. So we need a president who's respected throughout the world, and doesn't fear, you know, in any country in the world, proves that we're the strongest nation in the world, and and, and we certainly will welcome refugees. We this was the most giving country in the world. We welcome more refugees in this country than any country in the world, and that should continue. But people got to understand, with President Biden's inaction and incompetence, that's caused some strength on the world, and we've lost respect to, to most nations. And well, they don't see us as a superpower anymore. They see us as a joke. Yep. So all that combined is just going to come to our borders and cause us more problems. So we need somebody back in the White House who the world's going to respect. And uh, that is not Joe Biden. True. And the second aspect of this, as you said, is public health issue. Obviously, we're coming off of this entire COVID uh, uh, nonsense, I have to say, simply because the immigrants are coming through our southern border completely unvetted, medically and otherwise, while we're keeping our Americans locked up. And I'd like to bring up something that I don't know if you have followed or not, but it's important for our listeners, obviously, because they're Serbian-American. We have a U.S. Open tennis tournament coming up in New York, and one of the probably healthiest men alive, tennis player Novak Djokovic, number one tennis player in the world, is not allowed to enter this country and play a tournament while millions of unvetted immigrants are coming through and nobody bats an eye. Well, again, I think this administration has mishandled that. At the same time, they require a military take a jab. Uh, they weren't requiring that from any way it's from across the board by the hundreds of thousands. But it, it goes deeper than that. I mean, just COVID is just the latest disease. Disease comes across that board every day. Yes. I mean, measles is, like, measles, measles is not present on the, on the uh, processing facilities. This country beat measles decades ago. And TB, uh, TB is a very serious illness that comes across that border. I know. You know, a lot more places have been tested for TB because so they've been counting people with TB and have to go through a whole testing procedure make sure they don't have it. And, and TB is a very serious element. When I was an ice director, we had one person with TB that was unrecognizable. It was a strain we never saw before, and the medical professionals were stumped how to treat it. We took months for working with the Texas Department of Public Health and the CDC to try to come up with some sort of cocktail that we can give this person to treat this TB. Now, think for a moment. If he would have been... If he would have got away, not been arrested, he'd be in the local community. If he had children, he'd be in the local school system. So uh, COVID is just the latest disease that comes across that border. Disease comes across that border every single day. And I've had facilities, we had to shut down. We had a couple people with a GB or, or chicken box or measles or whatever. We had a cohort of the entire population. So disease coming across that border is a very real thing. In the, in the United States government, you know, there's immigration laws on a book that you gotta be vaccinated, you gotta go through all these health screenings before you come in. Yep. Uh, when you're when you're a legal resident, but those you would think those same requirements would be for those across the border illegally, but they're, they're simply not. Again, it's a failure of this administration. Interesting. Tom, I've seen you speak, I've seen you tear up um to to the horrors that you've seen on that border. What's the worst thing you've you've ever experience there give me one uh, example uh, look I've, I've had a long career i've been interviewed little girls as young as 11 years old mostly numerous times on cartels um, you know uh, 
for such a little girl to go through such a tragedy or live her the rest of her life. I found many dead bodies and investigated many uh, murders of cartels who killed migrants but they can't afford to pay their smart machines. Uh, the single worst incident was I was the lead investigator on a tractor trailer incident uh, back in 2003. Well, I'm standing back on a tractor trailer with 19 dead migrants at my feet that suffocated to death, been basically baked to death in a steel box of a tractor trailer with no air and in the middle of the Texas sheet. You know, these people were, you know, suffered a horrific death, including a five-year-old little boy that died in, in his father's arms. And his father died on top of him, and I had a five-year-old son at the time. So that was, that, 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 that kind of changed me forever. And that's why I fight so hard. And that's why I get emotional many times, because I, I've seen the terrible things happen on this border. And that's why I supported President Trump, because he got Ill, 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 illegal immigration to a 40-year low, and illegal immigration was down 83%. That means less people were putting themselves in the hand of criminal cartels to come here. That means less children died, less migrants died, less women got raped. I mean, it's just President Trump's policies saved lives. And this administration, they want to say they're humane, but we have we had over 800 migrant deaths on U.S. soil since Joe Biden became president. That is a record, a record, a, a huge record. 800 migrants have died in U.S. soil. Have you heard a single word about it? No. Wow. We had over 100,000 Americans have died from fentanyl overdoses. Yes. That 95% comes across the border. So don't tell me Biden's policies are humane. They're killing more migrants. They're killing more Americans. Tom, let me ask you this. Are rape trees something that is a true story? Can you tell me quickly what that is? Because our listeners probably don't know about this horror. Rape trees are something the cartels do. It's almost like a trophy because they're, 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 these people are useless or sick or animals. There's, they, they, they bad trees where, like I said, they rape many of the women that they smuggle through. And uh, after they rape them, they hang, hang their undergarments on the trees like a trophy form. So when you see a tree come across a tree with, you know, dozens and dozens of, of female underwear on them. And it's just a sick, sick thing. And, uh, you know, you're going to cross all these female migrants and they carry challenges with them because they know they will get raped they, or they take the morning after pill. And it's sad. It's, it's just sad that, you know, when you open the border up like this, again, when you when you make promises, you can cross the border, you won't be detained, you can't be arrested, you won't be removed, we'll get your free health care. The rest of the Biden administration is done. The most vulnerable people in the world are going to put themselves in the hands of criminal cartels and be smuggled here. And that's when all these, you know, these disgusting things happen to them. These women will never be the same. And I was in Texas last week, and they, you know, sheriff had pictures of women that were raped and later killed. I mean, the uh, the rape keys are real. I asked the same question to the sheriff out there, and he said they were. He had pictures of them. So, and the media again wants to say, oh, that's something. That, you know, that's just red meat for the base, and they're making that stuff up. No, the, the sheriff I did this last week. Verified that so, yes. it's, a, it's, a, it's a real thing. And I wanted to ask you that because I've even seen children's undergarments and even diapers. That is the treachery that we are dealing with. Tom, as you said, people are willing to sacrifice their own lives to come into this country. And yet the left would have us believe that this is the worst country in the world, yet so many people still flock to these shores. So America truly is that lightning pillar on the hill. And there is a reason why everybody wants to come to it, but we need it absolutely under control. Any last words of wisdom for our listeners? And I'm going to see you soon, I'm sure. And we're going to talk more about this. I'll just say that again. I think we need to touch base with congressmen and the senators and, and demand they take action. Don't let them tell you they don't control Congress because they, they control half of it. And they can simply boycott meetings with Dems. But stay on top of them. They got to get to the voting booth. They got to get, we got to take Congress back in November. We got to take the House and the Senate, which means don't sit at home thinking you're one vote don't matter because it does. And not just for federal elections. You know, you get, people need to get out there and vote for the school boards and their mayor and their city councilmen. We got to take this country back because we're losing it. This isn't the same country I grew up in. It's changed a lot. So your listeners need to get active, raise hell, get out there and vote, call your congressman. Do not lay down and let this happen. This is your nation too. And these people work for you. They're accountable to us. Not yes. the way around. So get involved, raise hell, and let's take this country back. 
Excellent. Tom, thank you so much. Our listeners certainly do understand this. They lost one country back in former Yugoslavia and Serbia. They're certainly not willing to lose this one. Thank you again, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.